It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Oh, 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 yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Monster Monday for Super Bowl Week 2022. And I wanted to get started off in the right way. And he's got travel plans later on the week. He'll be on the West Coast. So it is going to be a Monster Monday with an epic Super Bowl preview from the man, Greg Cosell, NFL Films, rock star, NFL matchup show. We'll get to Greg momentarily, but we're kicking Super Bowl week off in the right way by talking about the game and getting Greg's thoughts on some of the X's and O's we should be talking about and focused on all week. It's a new week, by the way, which means, of course, we're presented by DraftKings, but I love winners. I love sending you guys signed stuff. I love doing the cameo style videos for people that win the YouTube shout out, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, really trying to grow uh, the YouTube page, the YouTube following. So please subscribe and comment. I'll do, maybe I'll pick more than one a week to do a video for. I don't care. As long as you guys are subscribing and as long as you guys are commenting and helping to grow that thing, that is much appreciated. As we did with the Twitter DMs, if you have ideas or suggestions for how we can grow the YouTube page faster, certainly let me know. We will have a spread the word winner via social media at Ross Tucker NFL at Ross Tucker Pod, as well as a sponsor confirmation email winner on Friday. Still have an amazing array of press passes from this year that I'll get to later on in the week. Take advantage of any of the sponsors, ExpressVPN, Raycon, Keeps, LinkedIn, 100 Flowers. They are all, all of them still available on RossTucker.com if you forget what the codes are. But I'm also going to be talking about them this week. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. He joins us every week. I do like every once in a while keeping you guys on your toes. I know I, Thursday we record 7.15 a.m. I know everybody's got their routine. I got it. But I also like talking to Greg on a Monday every once in a while or a Wednesday, Friday sometimes to change things up. Obviously, Greg, we're going to go hot and heavy. And you should all follow him on social media. I think most of you do, at Greg Cosell. We're going to go hot and heavy, Greg, on the matchups for the game. But before we get to the game, there have been two head coaches hired since we talked Thursday morning. They both come from the offensive side of the ball. And so I think our Dolphins fans, our Jaguars fans, would just love to hear your thoughts on, on what to expect from these guys, you know, from an offensive system standpoint, uh, maybe from a play caller standpoint. We can start with Mike McDaniel who got hired last night from the 49ers to go to the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, you know, I had an opportunity, Ross, last summer, this past summer, to spend time with Mike McDaniel, obviously at the time the OC for the Niners, and he's a fascinating guy. I mean, he's he comes across when you just talk with him almost like a football savant. I mean, he's, he's very thoughtful. He thinks the game in a way that, that I found really interesting. I mean, I came away – from speaking with him, saying to myself, God, I really know a lot and I really don't know anything. That's the way I came. I came away from conversations with, with Mike McDaniel. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of people in the league who view him as the zone run game savant. Obviously, Kyle Shanahan's been doing it for a long time. His dad did it for a long time. But there's many who believe that McDaniel is the real genius behind the zone run game. So, you know, that will be the foundation. He'll have a quarterback in, in Tua who in some ways is like Garoppolo in the sense that there are limitations that you have to work through. I think he'll have a really good feel for that because of where he's been. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would be pretty pleased if I was a Dolphins fan, given Mike McDaniel being there and what he can do with that offense. Um, and the other factor that plays into it is because they're so good with run game design, I don't think they're going to feel that they have to go get, you know, a big time first round type back. I'm not saying that what they have now is the answer. That's up to Mike and, and his staff to decide. But they've obviously had great success running the football 
with the 49ers. Uh, and he, by the way, he's been with Kyle Shanahan, I think, for 15 years. So they're not going to necessarily feel they have to go get a big time back with a high draft choice. The other head coach that got hired, by the way, Greg, that was phenomenal. That was awesome. Um, exactly what I was looking for. A as for Doug Peterson, I need to be honest with you, Greg. I am surprised that he wasn't thought of as like a hotter candidate. Right. I mean, he was a head coach for four years. And he won a Super Bowl. He won a Super Bowl in, in a city that had never done it before with Nick Foles against Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. And by the way, then he made the Super then he made the playoffs two more years. Oh, actually he was a coach for five years. I take that back. Then he made the playoffs two more years. Um, again with all kinds of injuries and quarterback issues. I I I think Doug Peterson, you know, you're talking about a guy that has a proven track record there. And he's still a relatively young man. I I, I thought everybody would want to hire him. Yeah, and I think one thing you'll see, and, and the one way I'll address this is, I think Doug Peterson clearly understands the importance of all line play. And I think he's going to start there in rebuilding this team because Trevor Lawrence is obviously a talented player. And Trevor Lawrence was under significant arrest this year. We, we talked about that throughout the season. We were surprised by that, Ross, to some degree because of their all line having been together. Now they had some injuries, obviously, and that changes things around. But I think he'll start with the offensive line. And obviously, they have the first pick in the draft, and they're not going to draft a quarterback. So it will be very interesting to see who they draft. Many feel, and I haven't gotten to offensive linemen yet in my tape study of, of draft picks. I'm just kind of starting that now. Um, but, you know, there's a, apparently from what I, I hear, there's it's a big class of offensive tackles. So it would not surprise me at all if that's the direction they go and Doug starts there because that's for, I think for him, he feels that that's where it must begin. And particularly when you have Trevor Lawrence. That makes sense. And yes, uh, nobody's gotten less out of the investments and the time that the Jaguars have put into that offensive line. I mean, That's a great point. That's a great they're point. They're high picks. Yeah. They're big free agent signees. Yep. They've started next to each other for years. I mean, something's very wrong, very, very wrong when you've invested those resources and that amount of time and the continuity that that group should have to get the lack of production. Yeah, it just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. You're right. It's not not a good look. Not a good look at all. Uh, what is a good look is playing in the Super Bowl, Greg. I know you'll be recording the matchup show out there, right? Out in L.A.? Yeah, we'll be uh, recording the NFL matchup show um, the day before Saturday. And uh, because, as most people know, Disney owns ESPN. We'll be uh, doing the matchup show on ESPN set at Disneyland. So maybe Mickey will be our featured guest for the uh, shoot. But uh, that's where we'll be on Saturday shooting the show, Ross. That is very cool, man. Very, you gonna do some rides after that, Greg? I don't know. You know, it is. I mean, <laughs> it is that. You know, they tell me it's the happiest place on earth, along I guess with Disney World in Orlando. So we'll we'll see what happens. You know. Hey, I will say this: with every year I get older, the less I can tolerate any type of like roller coaster or like spinning around. Why is it when you're eight years old you can spin around and around and around? Meanwhile, I spin like twice. I'm like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I was ne I was never good at that, even when I was younger. That I guess it was an equilibrium thing. That never – there are many stories which are, are for another time, Ross. But, uh, well, you know, I was never good at that. But I've been to <laughs> Disney World. Yeah, I was there with my kids when they were younger a number of times. I like that stuff. I, I You know, not those rides, but I like Disney World. I like the whole vibe. Let's get to uh, Bengals offense – against the Rams defense when the Bengals have the ball what are you thinking what will you be watching break it down for me Greg couple of points everybody knows that the Bengals O-line is not a strength and everybody knows that the Rams D-line is a strength the Bengals know that the Rams know that so the question is how do you compensate for that and how do you camouflage that because that can't be – you can't lose the Super Bowl, Ross, if you're the Bengals and say, oh, we lost because of our all line that, that can't happen, and they know that. So now that gets into what their approach is. So what is their approach? Do they line up in more snaps of 12 personnel and try to throw the ball that way? 
Um, how much do they choose to run it? They are a running team. People might forget in the AFC championship game, Joe Mixon had 21 carries, 16 came on first down, and 11 came out of 12 personnel. So if they're going to do that, that means they're going to get the Rams in the Rams' base 5-2 front. Now, you can also throw the ball out of that because in that front, Aaron Donald lines up inside. He is not an edge player in that front. Uh, when you go with 11 personnel, you could get Aaron Donald as a wide player. They've done that. They even line up in what we call loaded fronts, where there's three defensive linemen to one side of the offensive center, and two of them are actually outside of the offensive tackle. And we've seen Donald be one of those guys outside of the offensive tackle. That is a tough deal for an offensive lineman because he gets a running start at an offensive guard. Look, Ross, you played offensive guard. Imagine Aaron Donald getting a six, seven yard run right at you. That's a tough deal. Um, and I've spoken to offensive line coaches about that, and they say that's very, very difficult. Plus, you get all the stunt concepts from those loaded fronts. So I think the big one big question is what the Bengals decide to do from a personnel standpoint. What's their predominant package? What do they do on first down? What do they do on third down? Um, the ball has to get out of Burrow's hands. You can't rely on Joe Burrow running for first downs like he did in the AFC Championship game. Is he incredibly mobile? Yes. Does he navigate the pocket maybe as well as any quarterback in the league? Yes, he does. But you can't rely on improvisation to, to beat the Rams defense. A couple thoughts, uh, Greg. Number one, when Aaron Donald gets that running start, interior linemen – are not used to space. No. <laughs> space is not their friend. Yes. You know, you, they, they like close quarters, and they like getting their hands on the guy as soon as possible. Tackles are a little bit more used to there being some distance between them and the guy they're blocking. Interior linemen are not. So when you bring a guy from distance, you're putting an interior lineman in a position he's not normally in. Uh, now, sometimes linebackers blitz, but linebackers, the guys that blitz inside, they usually don't really have any moves, and they usually are just hitting a gap. You know, right. like they're, they're just supposed to go somewhere, whereas Donald can come from distance and then actually throw a move, yeah, and, and which is different. The other factor with that is often that front is a five across front because they'll put a linebacker as a stand-up player in the opposite uh, three technique gap you know, he's a three technique stand up linebacker opposite that loaded front. So it ends up essentially being a five man front. And then you get all kinds of stunt concepts off of that. And that's a bear to deal with. Yeah. Um, the other thing here, you talk about all the potential 12 personnel feels like CJ Uzama's health is a pretty big factor in that case. And, and that's a big factor. Now, look, he got hurt fairly early in the AFC championship game and they still went 12. They brought in Mitchell Wilcox, who's obviously their third tight end. What they lose with Uzama is the receiving element. And, and that's a big factor, but they still can go 12 personnel if they choose to. Um, the Rams tend to play a five-man front. Often they'll play a five-man front even in nickel. They'll go five across um, because you know what five across does. It sets up one-on-one -on -one protection, and you can work a lot of things off of that with stunts. So we'll see how the Rams decide to do that. But just talking about the run game, two players on the Rams' defensive line who are not talked about very much because of the emphasis on Miller, Donald, and Floyd are Sean Robinson and especially Greg Gaines. Those two players have been really, really good over the last month, six weeks. Gaines, he doesn't come off the field. People see him solely as a run defender. He plays almost every snap. And Sean Robinson has been really good against the run. What do you think they'll do with uh, Jamar Chase and or how do you think they'll use Jalen Ramsey, Greg? Well, all we have right now, and things change, obviously, with two weeks and a Super Bowl, but all we have is what they've done this year. And what they've done this year is not use Ramsey as a matchup corner. That doesn't mean it won't happen, as I said. We don't know that. Maybe that's the answer. But if you use him as a matchup corner and decide to play more man coverage, don't forget this team was one of the lowest percentage man-to-man -man coverage defenses in the league throughout the season. So if they do that, and they want to play more man across the board, 
and they want to match Ramsey on Chase, then you have 5'11", 185-pound Darius Williams, a nice player, matched against 6'3", 220-pound T. Higgins. So there's a matchup there that would likely favor the Bengals. Now, you could also line up Ramsey on Chase when Chase is the boundary X, meaning the single receiver to the short side of the field. And you could also play zone on the trip side, and therefore you don't get stuck with one-on-one matchups that don't favor you. But all we have is what we the film shows up to this point in time. And Ramsey has rarely been used as a matchup corner. Let's go to the other side of the ball. When the Rams have the ball, Rams on offense against the Bengals defense, Greg. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting matchup, too. And, and you know, a lot of people will focus on the Mike Hilton, the slot corner for the Bengals versus Cooper Cup, because the Rams are a very, very high percentage 11 personnel offense. And again, we don't know what Higby's status will be. If he does not go, you know, they they could play 11 personnel 100% of the snaps. So the Bengals will likely be in nickel 100% of the snaps or maybe dime, depending on, uh, you know, if it's third and long, but they'll be in their sub defense. So Uh, The question to me, as far as what the Bengals do, is how much man coverage do they play? Uh, You know, they're a team that mixes and matches. They tend to play single high. But again, with two weeks, they could certainly play more split safety. That is part of what they do. They just don't do it as predominantly as single high. Um, So we'll see. Um, You know, I think that what the Rams do exceptionally well is through the use of – formation they get clean releases for their receivers very often cooper cup cup gets free access off the ball and when he is allowed to sort of set the terms of engagement through the use of his vertical stem he is very hard to defend he gets corners off their spot how often is he in this in the slot greg how often would it be hilton against cup quite a bit coop cup is predominantly in the slot although in, in the NFC Championship game, the, the Rams moved him around a bit. The touchdown he caught, the 16-yard touchdown in the back corner of the right end zone, he was actually the boundary X. Um, he's normally not in that position. But again, with two weeks, things change. Uh, but normally, Cup is in the slot. Because I know the Bengals – Think that Mike Hilton's the best nickel corner in the NFL. So and he's a really good player. He's a yeah, really I mean, on good some player. level, that's to their favor, right? I mean, I'm not saying he can just man up Cooper Cup in the slot and dominate. I'm just saying if you're going against a guy that's having the best receiving season in NFL history, it's nice that you at least think the guy covering him is the best doing it in the nickel, right? Yeah. Oh, and, and I, I've always loved Mike Hilton, even when he was with Pittsburgh. He's small, but he's feisty, he's competitive, he's got really good quickness, he's a really good player. Um, you know, so the question, like I said, the question becomes how much man do they play? How much zone do they play? And one thing I think you'll see a lot of in this game, I think when I say a lot, that's always relative. I think you'll see the Rams go no huddle selectively. And I think you'll see the Rams go no huddle and go empty because Stafford likes empty. It regulates the defense. It minimizes communication and adjustment. It gets the defense set. So I think you'll see the Rams selectively go no huddle, and they certainly will go empty sets. Check him out on social media at Greg Cosell so you know everything that Greg is always up to and the content that he is producing and putting out there. Greg, have an awesome week. Excited to talk to you about it next week after you break down the Super Bowl video. Thank you so much. All right, Ross. Appreciate it. Thanks. At Greg Cosell on social media. Love that dude. And loving me some athletic greens these days. Look, I'm not a guy that loves vegetables. I try to eat them. Like when I have salmon or a salad, I'll throw some vegetables in there. It's not my favorite which is why being able to essentially drink my greens for less than $3 a day, it's awesome. There's a reason why Athletic Greens is over 7,000 five-star reviews and trusted by leading health experts like Tim Ferriss, Michael Gervais. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and Five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do 
is visit athleticgreens.com slash Ross. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash Ross to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Tux Takes. Hey, Ross. Good morning. As you and Greg discussed, uh, two more head coaching vacancies have been filled. Dolphins hiring Mike McDaniel. Jags hiring Doug Peterson. Right. I think I touched on Peterson on Friday with Albert Breer. I think maybe that came out while we were talking. Um, As for Mike McDaniel, it's interesting. I had no idea that Mike McDaniel was, and forgive my ignorance here. I've seen it. I've seen it written as biracial. I've seen it written as multiracial for Mike. I'm not sure which one is correct or if those are the same. So I'm admitting my ignorance there, but he's biracial slash multiracial. You know, that's another thing, Brian, that I should just mention. I don't think it's healthy that I'm like, when I say that, I'm nervous. I'm like saying it wrong and someone's going to get mad. Like I mean, well, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, I don't know the right term. I'm being, I don't know. I've seen both. So maybe someone, maybe I'll Google it. Maybe someone can educate me on the difference between biracial, multiracial, or actually more importantly, uh, what, what it is for Mike McDaniel. So as a result, the 49ers will get two compensatory third round picks. There was certainly a lot to be said on social media last night regarding um, everyone saying that Mike McDaniel is biracial or multiracial. I'll let you guys read that stuff and have your own opinions on that. I know this. The guy is smart. Uh, Evidently played wide receiver at Yale. I don't remember him playing very much. I don't know if he was a recruited athlete or if he walked on, but – If he walked on and that means he got in solely on academics, that's extremely – I mean, either way, it's impressive. And I've heard enough from him and heard enough people talk about him to think he is uh, a very, very bright guy. Curious to see how he ends up doing there. Tux Takes. Meanwhile, the Houston Texans appear to have shifted gears. They're now focusing their head coaching search on current D.C. Lovey Smith. So I feel bad for Texans fans, Bri. I think that this organization is an absolute disaster. You know, I tweeted last night after reports came out that Jonathan Gannon, the Eagles defensive coordinator, had been told that he was out. He wasn't going to get the job. That, as far as we knew, their two finalists were Josh McCown and Brian Flores. Now, I know both those guys. I actually like both those guys. You know, like if I saw them, I'd be like, hey, Josh, hey, Brian, what's up, man? They'd be like, hey, Ross, like we would talk. It's good. I got nothing against those guys. But think about all of the coaching candidates in the world. And the Texans' last two are a guy that's never coached in in college or the NFL and a guy that is currently suing the NFL. And maybe they don't care at all about Brian Flores, but I mean, at some point that has to take some time, right? If you're in a lawsuit against the NFL, doesn't that take some time if you're really committed to it? There's some time commitment there. It's just like, really? All these candidates and those are your final two? And I'm telling you, Brian, I don't think it was my tweet, but within an hour, there are these reports that they focused their head coaching search on Lovey Smith and they interviewed him last night. February 6th? Like your first interview with a guy that you might hire is a guy that didn't get any other interviews from anybody else, and it's February 6th. What are you doing, Houston? What are you doing? I, that organization, it would be surprising if they end up having success anytime soon, in my mind. And I got to also be honest with you, I wonder if they got pressure to not hire Josh McCown, who's a white candidate, who's never coached college in the NFL, and or not hire Brian Flores, who's suing the NFL. 
I wonder if the Texans got the word like, eh, why don't you guys find somebody else? We'd really like it if you guys found somebody else other than a white candidate with no experience and a black candidate who's suing us. You never know. Tux takes. Troubling news last night from Las Vegas after the Pro Bowl. Saints running back Alvin Kamara arrested for battery resulting in substantial harm. Doesn't sound good. Don't know any of the details other than, as far as I know, this morning he was still in custody, which that's bad. I mean, usually those guys, they make bail and they get out like right away. Like I said, don't know enough about it. Um, and we'll just have to wait for more information to come out. But at a minimum, it's not good. Tux takes. In addition to the head coaches we talked about, we also have a few defensive coordinators getting hired, including Patrick Graham in Oakland. Oakland? Really, Ross? Oakland? They still in the league? How how about the fact that you said it? I know. You're like Ron Burgundy. I am totally. Anything I put in the teleprompter, you just read. Anything, anything. Uh, I'm going to start putting other stuff in there. You're absolutely right. Gus Bradley in Indianapolis, Clint Hurt in Seattle, Terrell Austin in Pittsburgh. And no, we're not going to Oakland. So, interestingly, three of those four are minorities. Three of those four are black guys. Hurt, Austin, Patrick Graham. And also, I thought Peter King made a good point this morning. Peter King, by the way, is going to be my guest tomorrow on the show because he's plugged in and he actually has a possible solution for the minority hiring issue. The first person I've seen that actually wrote down a possible solution that I want to talk to him about tomorrow. But he made a good point when he said most of the hires are on the offensive side of the ball. So it feels like a lot of the black coaches are defensive coordinators, but those aren't the guys getting hired. It's the offensive coaches that are getting hired. Although maybe Lovey Smith changes that. Tux takes. Last two items include the Ravens hiring Sashi Brown as team president to replace Dick Cass and Roger Goodell sending out a memo over the weekend regarding the Brian Flores lawsuit. So Dick Cass is a Princeton grad. Uh, wonderful man that I've talked to a lot over the years before games and did a tremendous job as president of the Baltimore Ravens. Tremendous. Really like him a lot. Uh, congratulations to Dick on an outstanding career. Sashi Brown, so happy for him. You know, he was willing to think outside the box and try to acquire assets being draft picks and cap space when he was with the Browns. Didn't really get the time to see it through. I think it's awesome that he's becoming a team president. And I do think it's interesting. You know, I don't like how often I feel like we're talking about race. Uh, but it is a major topic after the lawsuit from Brian Flores a week ago. And it should be noted, at least a couple of the GM hires have been minority candidates. Sashi Brown, team president, as a minority. It's great. It's awesome. Um, which, by the way, just goes to show that those owners um, have no problem hiring minorities that they think are best for those positions. So as for the lawsuit... Yeah, Roger Goodell says we're going to investigate what Brian Flores said about the tanking, uh, and we're going to uh, we need to do better with minority hiring. It's just so weird. The NFL's messaging on this thing has been so weird. It's like they went from "That's not true at all. We, we will fight this" to now it's like you know oh, we better we're going to look into it, and he might have some he might have a case there. He might have some there might be some truth to that. Not sure I quite understand the logic there. I should mention we are one week from Valentine's Day, which means it is your time to go to myfrontpagestory.com. I have written five stories in the last two days. I wrote three more last night. I already wrote one this morning, and it is awesome. Like hearing these guys talk about their wives and how much they mean to them. It's like last night I said to my wife, you know, We've gotten a bunch of orders, hon. I got to I gotta help out uh, the team and write some of these stories. Just going over to the detached garage to write some love stories about women other than you. And she started laughing. She's like, I never thought 
uh, when I married you that I'd be marrying a guy that writes love stories, but I love it. I mean, I, I could do this like as a side hustle for sure. Reading what these guys say about their wives and then writing a story about it. It's very cool. So if you order a story from my front page story.com today, tomorrow, whatever for Valentine's day, there's actually a decent idea that yours truly will be the one, right? And it'll say, it'll say by Ross Tucker. I'll actually be the one writing it. Cause that's another lesson, by the way, you know, um, I own the business now, right? So I, I don't necessarily need to be doing it, right? But I think leadership comes in many forms and that actions always speak louder than words. And uh, the writers, including our full-time guy, Nathaniel, they are stretched very thin, working really long hours right now to get all these stories written. So what you do is in life, you roll your sleeves up and you help, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing I can say or any, anything I can, like he, he needs help. They need help. The other writers, the part-time writers, they need help. So trying to help them out at, for uh, myfrontpagestory.com. Peter King tomorrow, we will do the college draft with Emory Hunt today. Highly encourage you to check it out because we're going to go over the Shrine game and the Senior Bowl, which are the two biggest all-star games. Draft season is now. I'm a little surprised more of you don't listen or watch the College Draft podcast. We'd love to get your feedback on how we can make it better. Always looking to get better in every way, social media, uh, any of the shows. And I'm very open to constructive critique. I think everybody should be. If you're not, there's something wrong with you. Tomorrow, we'll have Peter King and the Even Money podcast with all of our Super Bowl bets, which is very, very exciting. Shout-outs are in order. HumanHeadNYC.com, Vision Comics with an X, Pizza Boy Brewing, SteakhouseSports.com, and Sportaculture. By the way, my guy Court from Sportaculture says he loves the way I say it. So, love it. Sportaculture. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feasts, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 109WITHIT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit. 